Good evening. I'm Johnny Fox. I preach for the Holiday Church of Christ in Cookville, Tennessee. But this week, we are over here with the good brethren at Morrison in Warren County. Been here several times through the years, going back to the 1980s. But uh, good folks, a really good congregation, beautiful facility. Uh, got a fine young preacher, uh, Chris Perry, and good eldership and a lot of good workers. You would be uh, very fortunate and blessed to be a part of this congregation, I can tell you that. And uh, they've been a lot of encouragement to me. So we're over here giving these lessons, streaming them, and uh, thank you for viewing, and I hope that we can accomplish some good in our efforts. Uh, tonight, we're looking at the family, the home, about relationships, uh, improving family relationships. Very, very important in our Christian walk and in our uh, homes and families to be close to the Lord, but close to each other as well. And I believe the Bible has a lot of great truths in regard to the relation between husband and wife and children that can enrich our lives and enrich our marriages and help us to be faithful. In Matthew 19, when they came to Jesus and asked him, the Pharisees, tempting him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for any, any cause or every cause, the King James says? Uh, can you get a divorce just for basically any reason? And he said, uh, you know, that whosoever, um, let me get it to hear exactly right. Have you not read that he which made them male and female said from the beginning, and for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more two but one flesh, and what God has joined together, let man not put asunder. So God doesn't want us to go through a divorce, if at all possible. They said, well, why did Moses then give a writing of divorcement to put her away? And he answered, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication. What's fornication? Illegal sexual activities. Bestiality, sex with beasts, animals, uh, adultery, sex where at least one of the two is married to someone else or both are married to another person relationships, uh, homosexual relationships, same sex involved there. These are acts of fornication. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Here's some strong teaching from the Lord in regard to holding our marriages together. That what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And we sure need a lot of teaching and help to make sure that we keep this recognition in our hearts and minds through the study of the scriptures that God joined together husband and wife and he does not want us to separate and divorce. It occurs, it's not his will and desire and we need to try to do everything we can to hold our marriages together. So what I've done with this lesson is from notes I obtained from lectures at the Freed Harmon University that I go to every year uh, Dr. Samuel Jones had some very good lessons on improving family relationships. And I took notes and I've added some personal illustrations to try to help uh, this lesson accomplish the goal of seeing the wisdom and the need for improving family relationships. Some certain facts regarding the marital status is everyone has some conflict in their marriage at some time or the other. Everyone does. You mean preachers? Yes, preachers. Elders? Yes, elders too. Christians? Yes, Christians are not perfect. They're just forgiven when we sin and make a mistake, you know? But we do have conflict. We're human beings. We don't always see things the same way. And sometimes we uh, are demanding and difficult there are times of sickness and not feeling well. There are pressures on our jobs, pressures in regard to family situations and issues that put a lot of stress on our lives and in our marriage. So what we're saying is conflict's going to occur. Don't feel strange about the fact that you're going through some conflict. I know the Hollywood image is the old Westerns, 
Roy and Dale would ride off together, you know, happy trails to you until we meet again. Well, that's beautiful and we love it, but that's not hardly reality. The Hollywood concept that you'll live happily ever after. Well, that can be a goal and we can work toward it, but we're going to go through some conflict. Um, uh, I like Gary Larson. He for years did the far side. I have a collection of his work. And my favorite of all times, he has a picture of Superman, that's Clark Kent, reading the Daily Planet, and Lois Lane, they finally got married, and she's uh, working on his Superman cape and outfit, and out beside the big S on his chest, there she embroidered stupid, S-T-U-P-I-D. And Larson writes down at the bottom, after many years of marital bliss, tension enters the Kent household. Well, the point is, I think, somewhat comical that even Superman, yeah, the big guy that can leap tall buildings in a single bound, even Superman has some problems in his marriage. Tension enters the Kent household. So if Superman has problems in his marriage, Johnny's probably gonna have some in his, and you probably are too. So conflict is going to occur. But you know, sometimes conflict is not bad because sometimes conflict draws us closer together, makes us stronger than we were before. I know that's true in our marriage, uh, my marriage, that my wife and I, I think, are closer now than we've ever been through. And we went through some difficult times, have gone through some difficult times, but it's, it strengthens. It's sort of like uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I was playing quarterback, and uh, there was a fumble and I dived for the ball, but a big lineman dived at the same time and his knee came down on my arm and broke both of the major bones in your arm. And so they had to take me to the doctor. And old Dr. Shipley, our family doctor, he's pulled my bones back together and set them. And I think that life is over for me because uh, I was, had plans on being the next Johnny Unitas. And uh, so my, my life is over. I have nothing to live for. And old Dr. Shepherd said, hey, dry that up. Um, you're going to be okay. He said, I'm going to promise you something. You'll never break your arm again in these places. Well, I've never broken another bone, so that's a pretty safe bet, I guess you'd say. But the point was, he said, where those bones were broken, they'll knit back together, and that'll be the strongest part of your arm. I believe that's true in marriage. If we can make it through the conflict... If we can make it through the conflicts, we will have the strongest, best marriage we've had. That's the challenge, though. The problem is how we handle conflict determines the outcome. And what we've got to avoid, the danger is that if we leave con um, conflict unresolved, it can turn into bitterness. That's what we've got to avoid, the bitterness. I've seen it, especially in the eyes of women, when they have given up, an old boy that I've known for some years wanted me to go with him to see his wife. They were separated. And he said, he got down on his knees and he begged her to let him come back home. And he turned around and looked at me and said, aren't you going to say anything? And I said, well, won't you let him come back home? He's begging you. And he promises he'll do better. She said he won't do any good. He'll still keep drinking and he'll still keep doing the things he's been doing. He won't change. And she'd given up. The bitterness was there. There was no hope. She said, I'll let him come home, but I, I, it won't do any good. Well, it lasted about a month, and then he was back to drinking again. So it was that their conflict left unresolved caused a great bitterness to develop in that family and in that marriage. That's what we've got to avoid. And you know, it's been amazing to me. Men, we men, are the ones usually that refuse to get help in our marriages. We refuse counseling. I'm not going to go see any preacher and talk to him. I'm not going to go see a marriage counselor. You're the one that's got all the problems. You're the one that needs help, not me. I don't, I don't need any help. I'm not going to spill my guts out to some stranger over here. No, sir, not me. That's the attitude of a lot of men. And you know when that changes? I'll tell you exactly when it changes. When... You go to the door and there stands the deputy sheriff and he says, I'm serving you papers from your wife. She's filed for a divorce. Oh, no, no, no. Don't want that. I don't want a divorce. Too late, buddy. When you could have gotten counseling 
could have obtained some help. You refused, remember? You didn't have any problems. Now, that's not typical of all men, but I've found it through 53 years of preaching, and I've been at some big churches that um, talked to a lot of folks through the years, and I'm telling you, in many, many cases, the men refuse to get help when they can, and ironically, will get help when it's too late. Too late. What, 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 can't you see? Can't you see it's too late now? You've waited. You've got to try to do something while you can. Not wait until it's too late and the conflict has turned into bitterness. What are some of the leading causes of divorce that occur? Well, first on the list, and always, and everybody agrees on this, these listings are pretty much very accurate, I think, from Dr. Jones and the lectures. Communication, yep, big C, that's, that's the one. We don't talk anymore. We don't communicate and talk to each other without getting angry and upset. We just can't communicate. Now, you can work with people <laughs> and they know you're having marital problems. Oh, they want to listen. They want to talk. They, they, oh, they, they've been through something like this too and they want to hear all they want to, they want to know and they, they're very interested. And it becomes a battle of dating or not dating, a battle of trying to gain attention and places in people's hearts and marriages that is a constant battle at the place of work. And sometimes even in congregations of the Lord's church. We've got to communicate to each other. A kind of a best friend relationship. At least a friend relationship. Whereby that we can talk to one another. Encourage one another. And listen to each other without being judgmental. Very, very important. Communicating. I had a couple to come see me one time. They were a part of the congregation where I preached. They were both 29 years of age. He was a big, tall, good-looking guy. She was a pretty little blonde. And they'd separated. But for some reason, they agreed to come and talk to this old bald-headed fellow. And maybe I could help him. We sat down, and I said, what's, what's the problem? What, 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 do you, what would you say is the biggest problem in your marriage? And she said, well, let me tell you what my marriage is like, our marriage is like. She said he works for the state of Tennessee. We have a farm. We have cattle. We have tobacco. We have hay. When he gets off from work for the state, he goes to the farm. We eat supper about 9 o'clock every night. She said that's the way it is six days a week, and then on Sundays we go to church about all day. You know the highlight of my week? And I thought, what's she going to say? She said, go into the grocery store on Friday night. <laughs> I felt so sorry for her. I don't even like to go to the grocery store anytime. And to think, whoopee, I'm getting to go to the grocery store tonight. Uh, boy, that that make tears come to a rock right there, I'm telling you. I looked at that old boy and I said, did you hear her? This is a highlight of her week. He said, she's telling it right. I work all the time. I love it. I enjoy it. But he said, I'll tell you what, if she'll come back home, I'll quit the farming. I can quit that. I need to keep my other job, but I'll cut back on the farming and whatever needs to be done, I want to do it. Now he, he wants back in this marriage and she's willing to come back. And uh, it's been one of those happily ever after kind of stories. It's been a wonderful return. They've had some children and uh, uh, to God be the glory. You know, I wish they were all those kind of endings. They haven't been, I'm sad to say. But the point that shocked me so much, why, why do you have to get in front of a preacher and sit and talk about things. Why could they not have seen this before? Why couldn't he see it? Why does it take, we've got to learn to communicate, talk to each other, and try to identify the problems that do exist in our marriages. The, another area of conflict in marriage, of course, money, budgets, stress, a lot of fussing and fighting over buying things that are not necessary, some of us men are like boys with their toys and we spend too much money and too much time with hunting and golfing and uh, fishing maybe 
And those things in the proper relationship, especially with our children, are good times and a good bonding thing. But when we leave our family and neglect our family, like one guy told me, I saw him at the golf course and hadn't seen him in a long time, and, and he was telling me that he had just gone through a divorce, and I said, what happened? He said, too much golf. Yeah, too much golf. Well, you can do that, and you can neglect your family, and you'll suffer the consequences. If you get involved too much in things of uh, activity, extracurricular activity, you'll neglect your job, you'll neglect the church, you'll neglect your family. It's not a good decision. Money stresses and money budgets, we need to learn to live within them. And the wife needs to learn that everything that's on sale is not necessarily uh, needs to be of necessity a part of her wardrobe, you know. We both got to live within our means to make a marriage work. There are sexual needs that need to be understood. Men and women are different. Men are from Mars. Women are from Venus, uh, some say, and the book's been written. The point is there are different needs that we have. The Burkin Faulkner series a few years ago uh, that many congregations showed listed the sexual needs to be number one of the needs of men by the survey taken, surveys taken, sexual fulfillment. For women, it was number 14 on their list, down to number 14, right after gardening and flowers. You know, it shows you some of the problems that we have. Listen to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, to avoid fornication, verse 2. Fornication is illegal sexual activity. All right. To that, for that not to happen in our marriage, what do we need? Well, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. All right, that, that should help. And let every woman have her own husband. All right. Let the husband render to the wife due benevolence. And that's King James language. It means may he give to his wife her due, D-U-E. Give to the wife what she is due in, her, in this marriage. Likewise, the wife unto the husband. Now listen, the wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise, the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud you not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, that you come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. Now, very plain and outspoken, Paul said, Every husband and wife needs a husband and wife. That would help, as the old country boy said, if you take care of things that need to be taken care of, then that'll keep you from getting into trouble. Well, that's true. It will help. We need a good marriage. We need a good sexual relationship with our married mate so that we can be fulfilled and not be so attracted to neighbors and co-workers, even co-friends at church and other places. If we've got a good, healthy marriage relationship, it'll help us to be strong and help us to make the right and best decisions in regard to sexual needs. There's the issue of leadership. That's a very important role in the marriage. Ephesians 5, Paul said the husband is the head of the wife and the wife is to give respect and reverence unto her husband. But the husband is to love his wife as he loves himself. Now, there you go. It works. If the husband loves his wife and if the wife reverences her husband and respects him and obeys him, then you've got a great arrangement here. We've all worked for people that we liked. We probably have worked for people we didn't like. The difference was the way we were treated. If the husband treats his wife like the queen of the house with honor and respect and appreciation, she doesn't find it so hard to be obedient to him and fulfill the needs that exist for him. So it is that we need to understand that the decision making, God said, husbands, I want you to be the head of the family. Now it's been brought up by folks, how long do you follow this leadership? And they keep making bad decisions. Well, it needs, some of us need help just because we're the head of the family. You know, the president of the nation has a cabinet that help him. The governor has a cabinet of men and women who help them make decisions and know the thinking. Husbands sometimes need help from a good Christian banker, from someone to help them make a budget, 
for, from a marriage counselor. They need help to understand some things in their marriage that could be better. So family decisions are very important. Uh, household tasks are a major cause of conflict because sometimes we rear back and we say, we're not going to do that. We sort of want to jump in the recliner and get the remote and watch the ball games, you know. And while the wife is working and cooking and cleaning, that's not right if she's been working that day also. Will a real man change a dirty diaper? Yes, he will. Will a real man vacuum a floor? Yes, he will. For his family, for his children, for his marriage, he'll try to lift burdens off of his wife. He'll try to do everything that he can to make her happy so that she, in return, will be concerned about his happiness and well-being. What are some techniques that strong, healthy families and marriages have submitted to make them that way? The way I understood it in reference, there was a survey sent to the parents of students at Freed Harmon University from those families that had really done well, it seems like, with their children, their home, their marriage. What's the secret? And here are some of the answers that came back and I think there's a lot of wisdom here for our marriages too. First of all, you've got to learn the ability to express your love. Titus 2 says the women, older women should teach the younger women to love their husbands. Learn to express your love. We're, too many of us are like that old couple that been married for 25 years and the wife told her husband one day, she said, you know, you told me the day we married, you loved me. And I believe in these 25 years, you've never said that again. He said, you're right. I told you I loved you. If I ever change my mind, I'll tell you different. Well, that's not very good. I think, I think we could do better than that in 25 years and learn to express our love. Randy Travis had a song a few years ago about the box. And it talked about in the lyrics that his father died and they went to the workshop and they found a box. And inside there were some pocket knives that had been gifts from the children, but they never seen again, he'd put them in the box. There were some letters and poems that had been sent to him while he was in the army by his wife, and they didn't know what happened to those things, and a few other little treasures. And the chorus of the song says, don't put everything in a box. You know, don't, don't put your memories and the rewards and the treasures in a box. Bring them out so others can see and others can know. We need to learn to express our love. Very, very important in the relationship of marriage. Learn to negotiate. Peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved through understanding, Albert Einstein said, and he's supposed to have been pretty smart. Achieve peace by understanding. A preacher friend of mine said that the biggest argument he and his wife have had through the years has been about getting to places on time or dragging around a little bit late. One day, they were going to church, and they were about 10 minutes late for Bible study. And he told his wife, he said, this is not going to happen again. I'm, I'm tired of this. He was the preacher of that church. He said, you get me all tore up, then I go out here and take it out on the brethren. And I'm telling you, this will not happen again. I will not be late again. Do you hear me? And he said, he wasn't late again either. He went and bought her a car <laughs> so she could come whenever she wanted to, I guess. You got to learn to negotiate. You avoid defense mechanisms like um, withdrawing and walking out and sulking and locking the bedroom door. It's not right. We identify all the alternatives, counseling especially. Christians do not believe in divorce. Malachi 2.16, God said he hates it. But sometimes... Christians are divorced against their desire, against their will. They are divorced and it breaks their heart and they try every way possible to hold it together. But through whatever situation it, that it involves, some folks are just determined that the grass is greener on the other side, uh, sadly to find out that's not true. So it is that Christians do not desire divorce and they want to hold their marriage together if at all possible. We need to learn to deal with disagreements when they come up and not wait until they become a very difficult situation of conflict. Deal with them. You know, I know a Christian couple that their philosophy has been they would never go to bed angry. He said, we've stayed up real late some nights, 
but we try to solve our problems. I heard a tape made back in the 40s from a f- man who he and his family had lived up in the Smoky Mountains up above Gatlinburg back in the 1880s. And he, in 1940, was an older man, but he had recorded some of the stories of the mountains. And he told about that when he and his wife got married, all they had was a cow, a few chickens, and a hive of bees. But he said, you know, we made it along pretty good. Had a little old cow barn on this cabin place way up in the mountains, belonged to his uncle. He said, no, one day they got into fuss. And uh, he told his wife, he said, now, if you keep talking to me this way, I'll go back to my mammy's house and live with them. She said, well, go ahead. If you think that's what you need to do, just leave me a lock of your hair so I'll remember what you look like. All that infuriated him. And he took off down the hill. But it was late in the day, and he knew she'd go home to her mother, and he was, didn't want anything to happen to her. There were bears up in those mountains. And so he hid behind the cow barn, and he watched up toward the house. An hour went by, and getting close to dark, and the wife came out on the steps, and she hollered down there. She said, I can see you down there behind the barn. She said, why don't you come on up here? Let me fix us something to eat. He said, I went up there and sat down and had something to eat. And, you know, that situation never happened again. He said to the young people he was talking to, don't go past the cow barn. Be be." Diligent to try to work things out to make your marriage a success. Deal with disagreements when they come up, not when they build up. You don't use an intimate fact to try to hurt your family, hurt your wife. You work together as a team. You try to see issues uh, and you can learn to express your anger without sinning. Jesus did. So can we. Be angry and sin not. Refuse personal remarks. They only hurt. Avoid jumping to conclusions. Song of Solomon 8 and 6 says that jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Avoid labeling each other and hurting each other. Solidify agreements that you've made and work toward making them to be fulfilled. We shared some thoughts from some lectures at Freed Harmon University in regard to family relationships. These are a blessing, I think, to me, I know to me, in our marriage, and they can be to any marriage and family. That would be our hope and our desire for you. And pray that something we've said this evening has been a blessing and a help to your marriage. Would you bow with us, please? Father, we thank you again for your amazing grace. We thank you again for hope and for helping us with our family matters and help us to learn from the wisdom of your word to love each other and be good to each other while there's time and opportunity. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we praise you. Amen.